caught up. So welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for our November Tuesday talks. Um, Anne and I have a bunch of special guests today. So I'm Britton Bostick. I'm the downtown and historic planner for the city of Georgetown. My Tuesday talks partner is Anne Evans, reference librarian with our award-winning Georgetown Public Library. And we have three special guests today, which is really exciting for us, two special guests to help us talk about this moved house mystery. But we also wanted to take this opportunity to talk about our design guidelines because we have a project we are just starting to update or give a refresh to our design guidelines. Um, and so we've got a little survey for you to respond to, trying to get an idea of who knows about the design guidelines, what do you know about them, um, why are we undertaking this project. So briefly, these are the uh, kind of special rules that we have in place for our historic districts. These are the rules that help us to take great care of our historic homes and our historic downtown buildings. And um, it's for projects for additions, projects for signage, all kinds of things are covered in our design guidelines. And to help us out, the city has engaged Post Oak Preservation Solutions and Anne McLone, one of the partners in Post Oak is with us today. Um, so Anne and her partner Ellis, um, and as well as other members of the firm are working with us on helping to craft design guidelines um, that really fit our historic districts, that really fit our historic buildings um, and are a great fit for Georgetown. And so the last time we had a design guideline update was in 2012. So it's been a little while um, and also council made some changes last year that um, HARC now reviews uh, projects that they didn't previously review. So now if you have new residential construction in Old Town, for example, that's something that HARC reviews and we wanna make sure that we've got some great guidance there. So Anne, thanks so much for joining us. You're in San Antonio today, I think. Um, I so am. a little bit down the road. Um, tell me, tell us a little bit about Post Oak and what it is that y'all do. Uh, Post Oak Preservation is actually relatively new. Um, we have been around for one year, um, but uh, I have um, had my own preservation consulting firm for about 10 years now, and my partners uh, were together for five years before now, so, uh, so we just, uh, we have plenty of experience. Um, what we really wanted to do as, um, as a firm was offer different sorts of preservation solutions to a lot of different um, preservation topics. And so one of the things that we're really interested in is design guidelines and helping cities uh, craft design guidelines that are specific to Georgetown uh, and not just a standard set of guidelines that are sort of a copy and print that we really want to understand Georgetown, we sort of laugh and say, you know, we want to go local. We want to, we want to see the, the historic district as, as Georgetown sees the district. We've, we've, done, we've done a number of guidelines up and down sort of the, the Midwest. Uh, I think the furthest north we've been is Winona, Minnesota. Done a lot in Nebraska and Kansas. Oh, lost her. Looks like Anne's feed may have frozen. Well, y'all know how Zoom meetings go. Um, so. What was the meeting on the day, you remember? Okay, well, we'll see if we can get Anne back. Um, but in the meantime, one of the things my, that we are. I just had to put in my uh, email address. One of the things that we are asking everyone to think about as we go through this update process is what would they like to see in Georgetown in 75 years um, if they could come back? You could come back to Georgetown and you wanted to see something in our historic districts completely unchanged and that would make you really excited. What would that thing be? And um, we'll have contact information at the end um, to, to share with you how you can uh, tell us what you would like to, to keep in 75 years. The first time we're going to have a public uh, kind of meeting on this is we'll go to City Council Workshop on December 8th. So be looking out for that. And the website that you use to get to the Zoom meeting, uh, historic.georgetown.org, there's a brand new blue button at the top of the page. And that's a button that'll take you to the project page for the design guidelines updates. So that's where you can get some more information about that too. Or just feel free to contact me. I'd love to chat with you about our process uh, as we go through it and, and let you know how that's going to work. So um, 
the next thing that we want to do is introduce our other special guests. So we have got Dana Hendricks with us. Dana is also with our award-winning library. So we have some really great library colleagues today. Uh, Dana has the most interesting house we have discovered. Um, and Dana brought me such a cool research project. We've been working together for some months on this. And then we also has Liz, have Liz, Weave, Liz Weaver with us. Liz is with Preservation Georgetown. Um, that's how a lot of people know her, but Liz is not only their historian, Liz is also an educator. And so Liz has wonderful research abilities. She is a great colleague for me um, and has helped us find out some things that were beyond my scope of ability um, and really get down into the details. Liz is the one who figured out just how old this house is. And so she has uh, very graciously joined us to help us uh, learn a little bit more about some of the research that she does and some opportunities that you have um, to partner with Preservation Georgetown if you're not familiar with one of the really cool things that they do. So thanks everybody for being here. Um, really looking forward to this. And so we'll get started with our move house mystery. This, uh, as it turns out, is the Eubank Daniels house. And so Dana, um, I was hoping you were gonna share some information with us, how we even got started on this process of trying to figure out where your house came from and how old it is, because your house is kind of an unusual one. And I, I think you knew that. Yeah, I am really happy to be here and talk about this unusual house. <laughs> We did not know in 2017, my husband and I, when we bought it, how unusual it was gonna turn out to be, but we were curious. So we bought this modest little house right on the edge of Old Town and the MLS listing said it was built in 1935. So we thought we had about an 82 year old house. Um, but the indoor elements and exterior elements of the house were really charming. So on the next slide, there are you know, we have, the house has 27 four over four windows um, in relatively good shape for how old the house is. Um, a 15 light front door and transom window. And then on the inside, even though the house was renovated in 2011, it still has a lot of the original, we assume original longleaf pine flooring, um, has an old pedestal tub that may or may not, may or may not be original, but it's quite old. Um, and lots and lots of windows. So it's a really charming little house. We just loved it. I remember looking at it the first time and looking out the windows and saying, it even has the wavy glass panes. I was so excited. <laughs> um, so then uh, the lovely young couple that we bought it from had lived in it and run a small Montessori classroom out of it. And they left us this key that was dangling from a cabinet doorknob and it really sparked my curiosity. The key was found in the 2011 renovation, which was done by Chris Casper. And they also left us with some stories. So Chris Casper and the Chagoys, the previous owners, told us some things that they knew or had heard. Um, one was that the house had been moved from another location. And we had heard of that. It seemed strange, but we had heard of that. So that seemed like, okay, maybe that happened. But then the other thing was they told us that the house next door was our second floor, or at least that there were stories along those lines. Um, and we kind of thought that was probably preposterous. We did not think that that could be a thing. Um, but all these things together made us really want to look into the house and find out more. So in May of 2017, the city's records department had a display of city records in the library. And we had just bought the house and up on the wall, there was this 1964 aerial view of Georgetown and it showed the block, which you can see there in the yellow square, it showed our lot on the block and the entire block was empty. So our house was supposed to be built in 1935, we thought. Um, and here's a 1964 photo with no house. So it was a mystery. Um, we did some research. We went back through, uh, you know, we we're mostly busy living in the house. We didn't have a lot of time to research it as well, but um, we did some research and the 2016 Historic Resource Survey was being, I think, kind of reviewed at that point. So we went um, with information about this is the house next door to us about this house and our house and we met with the architectural historians from Cox McLean who were doing the HRS for the city. 
Um, and we told them the stories we'd heard. We really expected to be told, you know, you have, and we do, it's a, in the HRS, it's a low priority house. The house next door is medium priority. The two houses, um, the, the house next door, their stylistic influence noted in the historic resource survey was folk Victorian, which sounded so, so appealing. And our house was noted as having no stylistic influence at all and basically lacking significance and integrity. <laughs> so we really weren't, and, and different build dates too. So we really were not seeing that these houses could be part of the same house, but the architectural historian said, yeah, looking at the pictures, I think it could be. So we were kind of flabbergasted at that point. So then um, they also gave us the 1974 aerial photo that showed, like you see here, that entire block had been filled in between 1968 and 1974. So clearly our 1935 house and the house next door and all these other houses arrived between 64 and 74. So now we have more of a mystery the Williamson County Appraisal District records online didn't go back far enough. So I worked with the title company that had done our title work and they gave me the ownership chain of this address all the way back. And we found that it had been owned in 1968 by Noel Daniels. So Noel Daniels was the owner of the local Piggly Wiggly and he had, owned, had bought the lot from the Shell family, he brought the whole block actually and he had been the first owner of the house. So clearly he was the one that brought the house in, but we still didn't know where it came from. The original stories we'd heard were, maybe it came from Liberty Hill, or maybe it came from Main Street. Um, we, had, we had various things, all of it seemed really hard to track down. So Preservation Month comes to play again in May of this year, uh, Britton and Anne had a series of webinars and we watched them and got so excited. And I emailed uh, Britton and Anne to say, thank you for the webinars. This was really interesting. And by the way, in case you have any tips, you know, research tips, here's the situation with this funny little house. And I'm so grateful Britton got interested. We piqued her curiosity with our mysterious little house. And she did some research and then she sent an email that said, with a photo that you're seeing on the screen now that said, do you think this could be your house? And we looked at it and we thought, well, I don't know. It seems, seems really different from our house. But if you notice across the first floor, this is looking at the side of the house. So Main Street is on the right. Um, this is the side of the house that you're seeing. And you can see four windows across the first floor. And then you can see a half round vent up at the top under the peak of the roof. So we looked at that and studied it and we couldn't really see that side of the house next door to kind of match up. But thank goodness we had pre-renovation photos. And on the next screen, you'll see this is a pre-renovation photo of our little house in 2010. And you can see on that side, there are four windows all lined up. There are also on the front porch, two exterior doors that you can see. There actually were three. The house had been a rental for years and years and years, um, probably broken into multiple, multiple um, apartments. And then you can see the post-renovation photo. There are only two, two windows on the side. So using those pre-renovation photos, it was clear that they had taken in the renovation two middle windows, put those on the front wall and removed the exterior doors. And that plus what you'll see on the next slide were what let us really match up with the photo of the house on Main Street that Britain had sent. So you can see the half round um, um, vents up there. So, this was huge. This was the biggest breakthrough. We were so excited. Now we knew it was not preposterous. Our house was moved to the site. It was moved from Main Street. Um, it had been a two-story house and our next door neighbors with whom we share a driveway and a carport, uh, they're living in our second floor. <laughs> um, so on the next screen, you'll see, I, I went through all of the Williamson County Sun for 1968, trying to find, desperately to find some notice of the house being moved. I thought it's 1968, it was a quiet town. I know houses were moved, but 
surely this was kind of a spectacle. And this house had been there for some amount of time. I thought at that point, maybe 30 years. Um, and so surely somebody took a photo and it ran in the paper or some kind of notice. I didn't find anything, but what I did find is what you're seeing on the screen. So Noel Daniels, who we knew owned the lot, um, he is standing there um, at Main and 11th, which is where the house that Britain found, 1010 South Main had stood. And he is standing on the site of a strip shopping mall that is still there. And that is what he put up in place of the house that he bought and moved to our lot. So that shopping center has uh, Rio Bravo and I don't know other businesses in there as well. And it's a block away from Dos Salsas. So um, that's where we're talking about. And it notes in this little uh, caption for this photo of Noel Daniels and the Strip Shopping Center that um, he is the town's leading owner of rental residential property. So that is what he was doing. He was moving these houses over to this block way far on the east side of town and using them as rental properties. So um, we took the information that we had from Britain and that we had otherwise and made contact with Preservation Georgetown. And um, Chris Thompson with that organization encouraged us to apply for a heritage home marker. Now, this was not something we ever would have thought of. It's a, like I said, a modest little house. We were beginning to have a good sense of the history and we thought it was fascinating, but we really didn't think um, that it merited necessarily any kind of, any kind of notice, um, but she encouraged us. So we did apply and that got us Liz Weaver. <laughs> so um, Liz took up the banner and continued researching the house. And I thought it was just kind of a miracle. She emailed and said, your mysterious sneaky little house has been found out. And she had uncovered the original construction date in 1886. So our little, our little house has a lot more history. Uh, it's a lot older than we thought. Um, and on the next screen, you'll kind of see a summary because I didn't want to leave out the people who lived in it. So the address over on Main Street was 1010 South Main. It's not an address any longer. The strip center that's there doesn't face onto Main. Um, but the first folks who owned the lot over there were William and Mary Knight. They, um, William passed away and Mary gave the lot to the property to her daughter, Caroline. So Caroline and her husband, Cyrus Eubank constructed the house in 1886. We know thanks, thanks to Liz. They lived there with their five children, including five-year-old Rex uh, Eubank. So they periodically took in boarders. We know a lot about them from looking not only at deed records, but also at the census to know who was living in the house, whether it was the owner or a renter. Um, and by looking through the census, we know that Cyrus and Caroline uh, stayed in the house into their old age. Cyrus died um, and his wife died three years later. And then Rex, who had grown up in the house since he was one, was the owner of the house. And he lived there with his wife, Lily. Uh, Rex was Lily's second husband. And they lived there for some time until they moved into a, another house over on Walnut. And at that time, the, the house began being a rental um, over there. So Caroline Eubank and her daughter-in-law, Lily Eubank, um, and their families consecutively owned the lot and then the home at 1010 South Main for 120 years. So our little house has this long history. And I think now, you know, I look at our wavy glass panes and I think that was Caroline Eubank and, um, and Lily Eubank looking out those windows. And it just, it has made everything so much more, uh, it's just pulled it all together for us. So we have we have our mysteries and now thanks to Britain and to Liz, we have lots of answers. Um, and I, I think that's it other than just to say on the next screen that I made this cheesy little photo. I, tr I wanna know so much how the house looked when it was in the original configuration. 
And we don't have a photo of that. We have these great photos from the side and that's helped us solve the mysteries. But I would love to have photos of the front of the house before it was broken apart instead of this one that I've pasted together after it was broken apart. Um, I would love to find photos of Caroline and Cyrus or Rex and Lily Eubank. Uh, you saw a photo of Rex on the previous screen, but he's the only one I've got. And I'd love to know the, the faces of the folks who lived in the house. And then any documentation of the moving of the house from Main to 4th Street. We believe it happened in 1968. That makes a lot of sense. We know it was gone from that one lot on Main Street. We know it was here, but we don't have anything documenting that. So I would, I would just put out a little appeal for anyone who has additional clues to the mystery. Okay, and if you, if you do have any clues or any photos or anything that you would be able or willing to share about this house, um, we'd be very interested in that, and you can email those to historic at georgetown.org um, if you're so inclined, or feel free um, to call, um, and we'll have numbers um, on the last, very last slide. Um, but if you do have this information, we're very interested in trying to complete our puzzle and fill out a few of the gaps in our, in our mystery. And that is all I have. I I have enjoyed talking about our mysterious little house. Thank you, Britton. Well, this is really great, Dana. And thank you so much for sharing this. Um, this is such an interesting project to research. And um, in the time that uh, since I've been working with Dana, um, a few moved houses have come to my attention through various means. Um, and so I'm aware of at least six different houses that have been relocated either from outside of Georgetown into Georgetown or within Georgetown or in a couple of cases from Austin to Georgetown. And so some of the houses in our historic districts um, really uh, the, the faces of them don't really tell the story that they have um, very clearly. And so it's always just such great fun when we can figure out um, in this case, the house is really much older than we had thought and its history and the people that it's associated is much more significant than we would have imagined from its current location. Um, and in a great way that it ties it all together. Um, and it, it's funny about this house too. So one of the things that really helped me, um, and I do have really great partners at Southwestern University Special Collections. Um, and so one of the things that helps me a lot is having photographs that I can look through and kind of understand where things have been over time. And I was so excited when I was looking through the 1934 photos that Southwestern has shared with me and saw a house that looked like what we were looking for. And I kind of had a similar response is there's no way this could not be it. And then um, it turned out that that was indeed it. So we found it on Main Street. It was right across from uh, the Georgetown uh, Elementary School. Uh, Anna and I did a presentation on Georgetown schools a couple of months back. So if you want to see that, feel free to watch the YouTube. But right behind um, this school, which is no longer with us, um, we had the Eubanks house. And so that was kind of an exciting find and to see where they had lived um, so early on. So if you zoom in a little bit again, um, there was a lot going on this block, and it's amazing how things get tied together in our history. So right behind this house, you can see the Episcopal Church rectory, and then right behind that, the Episcopal Church. So this was originally part of the Grace Episcopal Church. You now know it as Grace Heritage Church, and it's just right down the street and on the opposite corner. Um, but we've got a little bit of storytelling about that church. And so all three of these structures kind of had um, an interesting history of being relocated over time. We were able to have one more uh, kind of view of the house. It's from the back, so it's not a very clear view. You get a much better view of the Grace Episcopal Church and a little bit of the rectory. But um, we have these beautiful gable ends. Um, and when uh, when Dana was talking about this folk Victorian style, this is kind of really early in Georgetown's history. Um, we tried to get a better view from the, the overheads, but those weren't very clear. They were pretty blurry. Um, but sometimes when we're looking for moved houses, we're checking roof lines to see if the roofs match up and give us kind of a clear indication. So this is the 1964 aerial photo showing the house was still right there on Main Street in 1964. You can see the Piggly Wiggly kind of behind it and to the left. That ended up becoming our HEB for those who are familiar with that. And then as Dana said, in 1964, this was an empty lot. And then in 1974, you have the strip center. You've got this block fully built out as commercial properties. All those houses are gone. The Episcopal Church has been moved at this point, and by 1974, we see the house at 1010 South Main Street reappear as two houses over on 4th Street. So, um, Anne, 
1886 in Georgetown, we have some really great photos that I love so much, but help us to understand this house was built really pretty early on in Georgetown's history. It's one of our older houses. And so help us to understand what Georgetown was like in 1886. So we get a kind of a sense of what was going on when this house was built. All right, yes. And so these are kind of the photos that almost were. Uh, Dana's house is almost in these, just barely outside the upper left corner. Um, but in 1886, Georgetown is still less than 40 years old as a city. So it's still pretty young, but it's kind of a strange mix between two worlds. And in the 1870s, you have Southwestern arrive and all of that, that that brings. So the professors, the students, that kind of livelihood. You also have the railroad coming to town in the 1870s, which brought, of course, we've talked about massive change and growth to the city. The population grew exponentially. It grew 182% between 1870 and 1880. And then it almost doubled again between 1880 and 1890. And as we've talked about before, the railroad changed Georgetown's economy. So cotton became much more predominant um, it, because you could suddenly ship it to Eastern markets more easily and the cattle drives kind of died down. Um, but it, you could also get goods and materials more easily. So you see this massive increase in building. You start to see the downtown square that we know takes shape and you see all sorts of new housing going up. The taxable property in Georgetown went from $2 million to $5 million in this time period. Whoa. So it's just exploding as far as building, as far as people, as far as all sorts of things. In 1884, that standpipe that you saw in the last photo was established with the waterworks. So suddenly we have city water, um, brand new, but then you, Still kind of got this weird frontier feel. There's still shootouts happening on the square into the 1890s. 1886, that same exact year that the house was built, was the last really big train robbery in this area. Yeah, just down the road in McNeil and Round Rock. There was in 1884 also an option election on prohibition, which was voted down. So there's still saloons on every corner of the Georgetown Square and all that that brings. So it's kind of this weird mix between everything that, you know, is changing all of this influx of people coming and this still kind of in a wild west feel almost. Um, <clears throat> one of my favorite things though, is that even in 1905, there were still more pianos than bathtubs in town, um, which we kind of think like, oh, you know, you would think bathtubs, but it really actually does talk about what is happening with the society in Georgetown is that they're valuing piano so much. It's that type of education too. And running water is just not really a thing yet um, to some degree. And then of course, our biggest news in Georgetown in 1886 is that um, on the next slide, you'll see the, tree where the commissioners met and declared Georgetown, Georgetown in 1848 was blown over in a storm. And this was, of course, the big headline for the Williamson County Sun in June of 1886. So roughly around the time we think this house may be being built in that kind of summer era. Um, this is exactly what's going on as people are talking about the fact that Georgetown's first courthouse, if you will, was blown over in a storm. And uh, the trunk was saved for quite a while. For many, many times uh, things were made out of it. I think there's still some pens floating around. So that's just a snapshot of what's happening in Georgetown in 1886. There's a lot going on. Sounds like at some point we might have to do a webinar on um, the difficulties of courthouses in Georgetown, Texas. Um, there's definitely a lot. <laughs> So uh, we have Liz Weaver with us, Preservation Georgetown's historian um, and a great colleague for us. Uh, Liz has research abilities that are just really magical um, and she solved so much of our mystery. Um, and so Liz, would you mind sharing with us some of how you were able to figure out, um, I couldn't date this house. I had a really like, I think a three decade range in which I thought it might've been built, but you got it down to an actual date. And I'm so grateful for that. I got lucky with this one. Um, when I came into this project, a lot of the work had already been done. Uh, Britain had already 
done, the first thing I do, which is trace the title. Um, because the title to the land, who owned the land, gives me names. And from there, I can start looking at ancestry, looking for documents. And then I also start looking in old versions of the Williamson County Sun. And I, with this, with this one, I got back to the Eubank name and I could, I could tell from the prices of the property when it changed hands that it was probably during the Eubanks when the house appeared. So I started looking for, for evidence of the Eubanks in the newspaper. And I have a subscription search engine for the newspaper, which helps because that way I don't have to sit and just go through read and read microfilm endlessly. Um, but with a name like Eubank, he was a little difficult to research because he was a businessman in town. So he was in the newspaper a lot. He advertised and see Eubank appeared all the time in the newspaper. But I started looking for evidence of a house. And the first thing I picked up was 1883, um, which is before the date we established for the house. And my first thought was, aha, I found it because he applied to the city council to build a wood frame residence within the fire district of the city. And so I was like, hmm, I wonder what happened with that. So I started going, I went back into the city council records to dig and look. And I found in the city council meeting minutes that that was referred to, there was a fire committee at the time. And apparently if you wanted to build something that they might have to put a fire out on, within that fire district, you had to get approval to do that. And um, the fire committee recommended no to not allow Mr. Eubank to build a wood frame um, structure in 1883. And so I was like, hmm, that must not be it. So I kept digging and then I hit gold. In October of 1886, there on the left, you can see Mr. C. Eubank is having a two-story residence erected at his place on Main Street on the third block from the square. So this is about as good as I can get. And, and this, little, this little piece in the newspaper is what's called a local. Um, the old newspapers are full of these, everything from people coming to visit to kidney ailments to things being built. Um, and it's a fascinating snapshot of life in town. So I knew that he was building a two-story residence then. We know that he lived on the square from census records and things like that. I mean, in, on this block before that, but we don't know what they lived in. Uh, I'm assuming it was a smaller house when he and his wife were um, earlier in their marriage. So we found the house in October of 1886. And then uh, subsequently, the on the top right, he's added a barn. So he's, um, he's expanding. And at that time, that barn makes sense because everybody had horses and cows and things like that. And then also we have him adding improvements to his residence. And I believe that was even a little bit later around 1890. I can't remember the exact date on that. And I can't see it. Britton, if you can see it, feel free to chime in. Um, and and there, there were neat improvements, somebody thought. Uh, so that was from June 21st, 1900. 1900. Um, yeah, so he, he added and um, one one of the things that is still a bit of a mystery with this house is, and Britton, have you got the Sanborn fire maps where you can pull those up? This is 19, what year is this, Britton? 1900 on the left and then 1905 on the right. Okay, so this is the house from above. So, you know, the house was built in 1886 and um, the right hand part is what we see that became Dana's house and the house next door. And that extension that goes to the left, which would be on the rear of the house, we don't know what happened to that, um, which is interesting because in the view that you're now seeing on the right, that's a later Sanborn fire map and that piece has gone. Um, and Britain, what dates are these maps? So on the left, we have 1910, and on the right, we have 1916. Okay, so we see that that staying there and then the piece going away. And then I believe in 1925, it comes mm -hmm. back again. And, and we may never know exactly what happened here. 
Um, one possibility is since we know that the Eubanks lived on this block, it was not uncommon at the time for people to take their old house and attach it to the back of their new house because it was usable space. Um, so it's possible that their original house was stuck on the back and at some point it was in disrepair and they tore it down and later rebuilt it. That's just a theory. Um, but, and like I said, there, there'll be things with these houses that we'll never know. Um, one of the good things about the sun is that when you find little tidbits like this in the Williamson County Sun, there are things that aren't included in other public records. Um, documents that we have today that builders execute when they're, when they're building a house just didn't happen back in the 1800s. So being able to find these little bits and pieces about you know, people adding onto a house or building a barn or building a house give you a feel for what's going on. Also along the way, we found that at one point there was a kindergarten in this house. And I know Britain's going back to that. Um, yeah. And this was uh, from 1899. And in the, you know, after, probably after all the Eubank kids were pretty much grown and Ethel Makemson was having a kindergarten school. And you've got here, the notice that she's going to have the kindergarten and then also her little advertisement in the newspaper uh, trying to get people to send their their children to her kindergarten which was kind of interesting um, and let's see I believe those are all of the clippings that we had from this one um, some of the things that I the tools that I use um, the Sanborn fire maps that you've seen are a wonderful tool. And this is from the library's webpage. You can get to those Sanborn maps. Uh, these are the digital versions. And if you have a library card, you can get to those. Also, um, the UT library has the color versions that um, we were looking at. Um, also for our library in the genealogy section and well, in the same section is um, being able to get to ancestry. And that's shown up at the top. And right now through, I guess, the end of the calendar year, you can access it from home for free. Normally you have to go to the library to get it for free. But um, this is a great way to get this as a resource uh, to use because sometimes when you're looking at ancestry, you can find photographs, people who've already done some of that work or have posted pictures and things like that. It's a really, really good source. Um, it's also been a way for me to get in touch sometimes with ancestors of some of the people who've lived in these houses. And they're more than happy to share pictures and information. So um, that's my bit about finding this house. Um, there are bound to be somewhere photographs of this house being moved because when Grace Heritage was moved in 1955, the roof had to be taken off of it because at that time, taking down the wires was not a viable option. So when this house was moved, I expect they had to separate it into its two floors at the time they moved it, um, which would have been a big deal on Main Street in, in the 1960s. And we know that Noel Daniel bought the property around 67, and then the Strip Center appeared in 68. So it's in a fairly narrow window of time. It just didn't apparently didn't make the sun. Uh, but you would think that people would have taken some pictures somewhere along the way. So um, yeah, if anybody's got photographs of this, we would love to see it. So I'm glad to um, that you brought up the Episcopal Church because we're going to use that as an example of what it's like to move a house. Um, but speaking of newspaper clipping, Sometimes when you're researching, you go down these like really fun rabbit holes and you find other information and you go, oh, I need to save that for later. Um, and so Liz has been wonderfully helpful to me because she's always got these tidbits of information. Um, and if I get stuck, I know I can ask her and, and she's almost always got something. So we were talking about, um, and I'll back up, this house uh, that became Dana's house was next to the Episcopal Rectory and then next to the Episcopal Church. So we're going to transition a little bit and show you um, how the Episcopal Church was moved. But the rectory, um, we talked about this kind of fire area and initially Cyrus Eubank had been told no by city council. He couldn't have his wood frame structure. And you would think, well, what's the big deal? But Liz, you found <laughs> it was a big deal because there had been a fire in the rectory. <laughs> Yes, uh, and, and it happened quite often. Uh, when you read the old newspapers, you see lots and lots of reports of fire. 
um, for the preservation home tour that we have coming up later this month. One of the houses of the three houses that we're we're um, looking at was badly damaged in a fire. And in this case, um, the Episcopal Rectory caught fire. And luckily there were people by who, you know, immediately discovered it and dumped lots of water through the roof and put it out. And, um, you know, they, they saved the firemen from having to turn out in the cold and they saved both the Episcopal Church and the Eubank House next door. So um, yeah, fire was a very big hazard uh, back during that time. And um, uh, people were very, very concerned about it. Well, reasonably so, because we might not have had Dana's great house um, today if, if somebody hadn't, if these brave young men hadn't been available standing around in the cold waiting for a fire to put out. Um, I really love these new newspaper accounts. Um, but Dana had also shared some uh, photos from the 2011 um, rehab of her house. And so this is really great, fun um, photos from the backyard. You can see at that point in time, the house is, has been set up on a pier and beam foundation. You can see a photo of the bathroom before it got rehabbed um, using some, that's definitely not an original sink um, unless you, that looks like it might've been an original sink um, at my school when I was a kid, but maybe not for a house. Um, and so we've got some photos of the interior too. So if you've never seen an old house remodeled, they tend to have really, really beautiful wood, um, old growth lumber um, that's really dense and really strong and, and has this gorgeous golden reddish color. And it's one of my favorite things about seeing old houses uh, as works in progress is that you get to see these really beautiful materials. And so you can also sometimes see some really interesting wallpaper and paint choices. <laughs> and then uh, there's sometimes some uh, gas lines and, and other plumbing lines that would have been really typical at the time, but maybe we don't use anymore. So um, I was excited that I got to see pictures of this house um, after it got moved. So this is not original, original state, but before it had some of the work done, um, including this little kind of telephone niche, uh, which I remember very well from my grandparents' house. Uh, some of these great tile floors. So thanks so much, Dana, for sharing these photos with us. Get a little bit of a, a glimpse of what the house was before currently um, and if you'll notice, um, some of these interior doors are really kind of short. I'm not a particularly tall person, but uh, these doors are, are kind of short even for me. So it's just funny to see how things change over time. Um, and there we have the house again before some of the windows and doors got moved around, some changes got made later on. So that's pretty fun. But what does it look like to move a building? So we're talking about this house got moved and it got cut into two pieces. And I really have a hard time picturing that sometimes, but with such an excellent crew of colleagues helping me out, we were able to get some photos. So we wanted to show you what it was like when Grace Episcopal Church was moved. It's had three different locations. And so it's Grace Heritage Church now, but originally it was Grace Episcopal Church. It was there at the corner of Main Street and Ninth Street. And this is um, kind of a, a very early on view. Um, I don't know what the date is on this photo, but it's so pretty. Um, it's just so wonderful to see this. It's also really interesting to see the trees and the fences and the outbuildings around it. Um, that's really great fun. And then we can see what I suspect were either, I'm not sure those were electric wires, maybe telephone wires starting across the street. But houses can and do, um, and smaller buildings can and do, get put onto the backs of flatbed trucks. And so uh, Liz was talking about the, the church had to have its entire roof and bell tower removed. And you can see the power lines that they're kind of backing this uh, structure under, so you can't have a particularly tall structure, it'll interfere with power lines, and then you've got a whole mess on your hands. And so they removed the whole top of it in order to move it, um, which has some consequences. And Liz, you were telling me, and you can kind of see it here, you were telling me after the church got moved and they put the roof and the bell tower back on, the bell tower was shorter than it had originally been. It wasn't this like really tall, kind of slender, elegant tower. They'd, they'd shortened it um, <laughs> for a while. Oops. <laughs> They did for um, almost 30 years. It had this little squatty bell tower. And uh, this, was, this was from the 1950s because the church was moved the first time in 1955. And um, the building next to it, I can't remember the name of it. That was the rectory, the new rectory. And um, the, the church, when they moved the church out here onto university, the idea was that they wanted to grow their congregation and that by moving closer to the university, that might 
uh, that might do the trick and it actually did, but they cut a little costs along the way and they put this short bell tower on it. And after the church basically outgrew this building and donated it and it became Grace Heritage Center when it came back onto Main Street, uh, when the bell tower was rebuilt, it was rebuilt back to its original height. And luckily this time, it didn't have to have its roof removed. Um, it came from University Street down Maple Street and then turned left onto 7th Street. And this is, this is one of my favorite shots on the left. It's coming past First Presbyterian Church. Uh, so you've got, the, my husband calls this the dueling church picture. <laughs> uh, it's coming up 7th Street. And then apparently they decided when they got to the square that it had gone far enough for the day and they parked it along Main Street out in front of the courthouse. And given the number of photographs I've seen of this, it appears that everyone who lived in Georgetown who had a camera showed up to take pictures of the church along the square. And there are lots and lots of good pictures. And then the next day they wheeled it into its place um, where it currently is now. And then, um, rebuilt the bell tower and with a, a huge fundraiser from Preservation Georgetown, um, completely renovated the building. And what you see now is, is, oh, there's the video, great. We have a little bit of video of the church coming down Main Street, super, super slowly. You cannot drive a house very quickly down the street. <laughs> right, and this is because of the way they have it loaded, you see it's loaded on the, um, on the trailer where the bell tower is in the back. So the area where they're going was a big parking lot and they were just able to pull straight in and then unhook the truck and they didn't have to back it in, which was nice, uh, but still a substantial move. And they managed to move it without breaking any of the stained glass windows, which was wonderful. That's quite fantastic. Um, and Dana, from what we can tell, I don't know that they broke any of the windows in your house either, because it looks like a lot of that glass is, is original, very, very old glass. Um, so it is possible to move buildings. Um, if they're of a certain size, it looks like this. If they're of a bigger size, they might have to be split into different pieces. Um, and so that's um, always an interesting undertaking. As building technology improves, um, my brother knew the, that we were doing this presentation today and so had found a video of a very large uh, building being moved. I think it was either brick or stone on the outside and they put these little kind of uh, hydraulic seat under the building after they kind of jacked it up off the ground, put these hydraulic feet under it and the feet walked the building over to where it was supposed to go and then they could kind of uh, remove the jacks and put it on a new foundation. And that was just fascinating to me that um, we've come up with so many different ways to move buildings <laughs> over time. We had wanted to um, show you some pictures of, uh, of some of the people, and I had thought, and Ann knows this about me, um, sometimes I find photos and I think, oh, this is the photo, and then I'll say, Ann, look at this photo, and she'll say, I don't think that's right because the date doesn't match. So uh, we had, I had found what I we thought might be um, a photo of Wilburn um, Douglas uh, as she ended up. So she was uh, Wilburn Dimmitt. And then she was uh, Wilburn Atkinson, and then her, her husband died. Um, we're not exactly sure what was the cause, but uh, it was in 1920, and, and they were kind of younger. And then she married uh, Rex Eubank, and they were married for quite some time. And then her last husband, uh, his last name was Douglas, and, and so she has this kind of very long name. But uh, Wilburn was the daughter of a man named Philip Dimmitt, who, if you're familiar with where the Century 21 building is, um, it's also the Demet building on the corner of 8th and Main Streets. Um, that was a building that she inherited from her father. She was his only child, and her mother had died a few years before after giving birth to her younger sister. And so um, this, one of the, the women who lived in this house has this great history, and I really wanted to show you all a photo. And then I thought we had the photo, but then we were looking at dates and realized that that may not have been who it was. And so uh, if you have any photos of, of Wilburn, um, originally Demet, but then uh, Atkinson, Eubank and then Douglas, um, we'd be very interested in that. And hopefully we'll be able to share um, a little bit more of her story, but there are some, um, you know, Georgetown was so small as Anne was saying, and we had so few people that um, it really, um, a, lot of, a lot of these stories overlap and connect together uh, in, in really wonderful ways and, and ways that are always really fun to discover. Um, and so um, thank you 
very much all for, for sharing your information about this house. If you're, if you need more information or want to share information with us, if you have any of the things that Dana's looking for, if you happen to have a photo or know of a photo or, or any kind of picture of this house being moved in the 1960s, we're very interested. And you can email or to ask us questions or send us information at historic at georgetown.org. And then you can also call us for me, it's 512-930-3581. Or you can also call Ann at 512-930-6614. Um, so we wanted to share Preservation Georgetown's information with y'all too, um, and not the least of which, a couple of really cool things. One is that if you would like uh, to work with Preservation Georgetown on having research done for your house and on their historic marker program, um, we've got the website there for you. You can also email them. Um, preservation Georgetown at Gmail. And then um, Liz, y'all were saying, or you were talking earlier, I think this is important to mention, Preservation Georgetown's annual home tour is going to be virtual this year, which means you can enjoy it from the comfort of your own home. Um, but Liz, I think you told me that this year it's free, but y'all are asking for donations. So do you want to share a little bit about that? Yes, thanks. It is free and it launches on November 14th. And there's, there'll be information about that on the Preservation Georgetown website and on our social media. Um, this year, we are doing virtual tours of three houses, uh, one on Ash Street and one on University and one on Elm Street. And uh, very, very interesting houses. And yes, this is, it's a free event. We do have a VIP ticket that you can buy that gives you, um, we partnered with Cork Winery and they're, um, they're doing a, a, like a wine and cheese pairing uh, if you want something to munch on while you're watching. Uh, but it looks like it's going to be a really fun event. And all of the money from this, all the profit from it goes to our preservation fund, which goes back into grants to help keep these houses in good shape. So uh, we're in the process of, of a grant cycle right now. So this is our primary fundraiser for that. Uh, for that grant program. So um, love to have you tune in and take a look and um, would love to have you donate to us and help with our preservation efforts. And Britton, one thing you did say, um, you mentioned the plaque, the marker program. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in the history of your house, but you, you just don't have the time or the inclination to research it yourself, that's what I do for, through Preservation Georgetown. Um, we when you order a marker plaque, we go back to try to find the original owner or significant owners and the date that the that a house was built. Um, and sometimes we stumble across things like Dana's where you have a date where it was significantly altered. Um, in, some time, in some cases, we can find out what builder built your house. Um, and anything I uncover along the way, clippings from the newspaper and stuff like that, you get all of that. Um, so you get a little history of your house, and if you want to take it further than that, you can always dig some more. But it gets you a pretty comprehensive history, and you don't have to do the legwork. So, uh, and at the same time, you get a wonderful plaque that will celebrate your house. And in the case of Dana's, hers is going to have one of the more unusual names because it's going to be the Eubank Daniels house for Cyrus and Caroline Eubank and Noel Daniels because they were both significant owners and it will bear two dates, 1886 and 1968, since the house had such a significant change. Thank this you. Is, this is so fun. Uh, so if you're, if you're interested um, in that, please reach out to Preservation Georgetown. Um, this is one of the wonderful ways that they support historic preservation in our community. Um, and one of the great things um, that we all enjoy and want to be able to share and have other people have access to is knowing the history of our town. And um, that's so important and helps us all to be better stewards. So really appreciate Preservation Georgetown providing that. And they provide great support to me um, in my efforts to understand our history better and, and the histories of these properties and, and structures. So Nat, did we have any questions that we need to answer? Does anybody have any questions as we get our hour wrapped up? There are still a few people hanging with us on Facebook Live. Um, there are no, uh, nobody's posted any questions at Facebook Live. I do appreciate some of the conversations between the panelists um, uh, in the chat function. So that's also available to you there. Um, is there anyone that's joining us through Zoom that wants to unmute or raise their hand with, for a question for the audience?
Well, if y'all think of anything, please feel free to reach out. If you have questions about our design guidelines refreshing um, the update process that we're about to undertake, please do reach out. Um, we'd love to meet with you and share some information. Make sure that you um, are plugged into that. And um, we do have the ability to add you to our, our email list if you need notifications for that project. And so feel free to email the historic at georgetown.org um, web or email address um, if you need to share your contact information or want to know how you can stay up to date. Um, so everybody have a wonderful and safe afternoon. Thank you so much as always to Anne, my partner in history over here. And thank you so much to Dana and Liz for joining us and sharing your knowledge and expertise. And, and, and Dana, for you sharing your home with us, this is such a great story and one that um, I really appreciate and I'm really looking forward to. Um, being able to uncover more moved house mysteries. We know they're there. We know that we've got some moved houses in Georgetown. It's just a matter of figuring out where they came from and when. So um, y'all take care. Feel free to reach out if you need us for anything. And we look forward to seeing you next month. We'll do our final Tuesday talks of the year in December. And we've got a really fun program coming for that. So I hope you'll be back. Thanks so much. Nice. Bye-bye.